so I'm really excited that you all stayed long enough uh, to come to this presentation. Can everybody hear me okay? I sound like I'm ringing for myself, but um, okay. Let me know if you can't. So what we're gonna, the presentation today is a case study <clears throat> on commissioning and energy management, uh, bring efficiency and savings to a school campus. So, and again, intended as a case study. Originally, um, I had the, uh, the, the owner's mechanical engineer was going to come to this as well and offer some insight. And he had to, uh, something came up at the last second so he couldn't come. So I'm gonna try and speak for him as well. But as we go through this, one of the reasons why I wanted to do it with an owner is that uh, to have an effective project or, and as successful as a project as this, it takes not only a good practitioner, but an owner that is, is, is vested in what you're doing and is supporting what you're doing. So at the end, a lot of my uh, um, lessons learned, uh, those actually came straight, I made him do something since he didn't come with me. But uh, so I'm Andy Heitman and w I'm with uh, my company's Building Energy Sciences and we do energy consulting, commissioning, um, uh, systems analysis. And then also BES Plus Tech is our, our software subsidiary and we used a lot of those products to, to accomplish this project. So we go through the standard AIA uh, rigmarole, you've got all that. Here's our learning objectives and um, this is kind of going to be, um, you'll see all these things throughout it but I'm not really going to hit it uh, like a Baptist preacher and go from stage one, two, three, four. Uh, hopefully by the end of going through everything we're going to talk about, uh, you'll, you'll get accomplish this. So we're going to talk about um, assessing a building portfolio. Uh, one of the big problems that we run into is clients that have a large amount of buildings and a high percentage of those need help and where do you go first? And uh, one of the things to learn is you, you, know, you can't, can't fix them all at the same time. It took a long time to get them screwed up and sometimes it takes a little while to put them back right. So where do you focus your efforts so you're not spreading them too thin? Um, you know, doing this is in particular as an educational facility and I'm not sure about your locales, but our difficulty with education, and that's one of our largest uh, market segments, is that they keep making the summer shorter and shorter. So, you know, now we've got six weeks, basically, uh, and sometimes we want to tear an entire building apart and put it all back together in six weeks. So it's a difficult task. Um, and so talking about how do we deal with capital replacement and uh, commissioning energy management, how do all those mix together? And then using uh, ongoing commissioning processes, to not only make sure you get it right in the first place, but how do you keep it right? And then ideally, how do you make it even better than it would have been without that? So copyright and case study, well, you've got, you can read this, we'll go through all of these in detail in the presentation. So a little bit to, to set the stage, uh, where I'm from and where this project is at. We're in Florida, but we're kind of might as well be in Alabama. We're right there. So that's Escambia County, Florida, uh, far, far west end of the Panhandle. Uh, this particular county, this is our county map, and uh, it's a really large geographical area. So we've got schools mostly clustered down here, but we've got them that go all the way up. So we've got a large north-south um, uh, region here. They have uh, about 56 campuses um, with about 7 million square feet total. Uh, largest campus is about 300,000 square feet or more than that at a high school campus, and average is about 114. The project that we're talking about today is, is a 200,000 square foot middle school. Um, age of their buildings, so this is another interesting statistic. Our, our state catalogs all these things. If you're from Florida, you can get a wealth of information about each county's uh, building stock on the, on the uh, State Department of Energy website, but, um, or education. But our newest campus just opened, our average building's 37 years old, and 36% of our buildings are more than 50 years old. Um, so, you know, we're, actually kind of in an active building program. As you can see, newest campus opened 2015. They're trying to go through and close some of the older, smaller campuses, open larger, modern campuses as we go. But again, we can't address all these simultaneously, so we need to try and figure out where to go. Uh, so benchmarking, uh, everybody knows you know, what we, benchmarking, you're trying to compare buildings against each other uh, so we can tell which ones are good, which ones are bad. So. Energy Star Portfolio Manager is a common way of doing that. It's not something that we you know, actively use as our primary method. But a lot of times when we come into a portfolio owner, if they don't know any better, they don't have a very you know, complicated, it's one of the things that they can, it's reachable, you know, it's on a bottom shelf, an owner can put their bills and keep up with that. They have an energy manager. And this is the case here. They have a, two energy managers and um, these ladies um, keep track of all the utility bills and they enter them all into 
Energy Cap and Energy Star. And so they've got all this information available. So I know you can't read this list, but this is all of their campuses from top to bottom, and you start out with an Energy Star score of 88, and you go all the way down here to an Energy Star score of one. The building we're talking about scored a two Energy Star. So obviously it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out it's probably not a good building. But at the same time, and here's our district average. There's your uh, Energy Star threshold. The buildings up here, this 88 and all these, uh, our second best building, we just tore it down. So what does that tell you? What, what, do, what do, you know, numbers on paper tell you? You know, the most efficient school possible is one that we turn all the air conditioners off and open the windows, and we have 15-foot candles on the floor, and we don't have any outside air, right? So numbers on paper aren't any good unless you're actually going out to see, you know, and that's the case with that building. It was, it was slated for destruction, so they weren't putting any money into it. It didn't have outside air. It had window units, you know, didn't maintain temperatures. Yeah, it looks like it's efficient, but it's not. Um, there's supposed to be that check uh, an Energy Star program where you have a, you know, a licensed professional goes to make sure that you've got proper indoor air quality, lights, humidity, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't always happen. An Energy Star score doesn't reveal what's happening, so you make sure you put your boots in the building. This is interesting. I don't know if you've ever got a chance to do this. If you look at uh, everything that goes into Energy Star, there's a lot more that goes into Energy Star, if you're familiar with it, than just your utility consumption. So, you know, you're putting in your square footage, condition square footage, and number of people, the number of computers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and the black box spits out, here's your rating. So we decided we wanted to take uh, and do a correlation of all of our EUIs against our Energy Star scores and see how much of the Energy Star score is explained by the actual consumption. And we found a, a 60% correlation factor. So 60% of our Energy Star score is explained by our energy consumption. So this is where you know, we would rather use just raw you know, site EUI, so KB2 per gross square foot per year, uh, and use that as our identifying factor for looking at what's bad, what's good. Um, and then this is the entire district. We usually will break these down into a couple peer categories as well, say all your elementary schools, all your middle schools, all your high schools, and then do another cross-section of categories that would be by age. Uh, because some of those really good Energy Star looking schools are our oldest buildings. They just don't happen to be, you know, you know, have the same characteristics of a modern building. So in the case of this, what we did, this is as of January 2013. This is kind of was the birth, birthing time of this particular project. So everything we look at right now is going to be based on that date, and then we'll fast forward at the end and kind of revisit all of that. So at this case, here's our three, our worst of the worst down here at the bottom. Um, and they came in with EUIs of uh, our project school was this red bar, uh, 158 uh, KB2 per square foot at, per year at that time. And then these couple of others we mentioned, Warrington, and this is Bailey Middle School, Warrington Elementary at a 115 is also a project that we're in the middle of. It's kind of in the mid phase of what, we're do, what we did to Bailey. And then another one we'll show at the very end, this Global Learning Academy is one of our very newest schools. It's about Five years old, it came online, it was commissioned, it worked well. We noticed after a couple of years, it started drifting upward. So we, we implemented an ongoing commissioning program in it, and we'll show we, over that two-year period, we actually pulled it down as well. So we're, we're looking at about an average site EUI of 66. These are our, you know, what we're gonna target. So we're saying, let's start here. So we roll this back and get a broader perspective. What has Bailey Middle School been doing over time? And this is our district average EUI over this. So as you're going from an eight-year history now, and then here's your EUI mountain, as I call it. So, you know, we were 120, then we went up to 180, higher than 180, then we came back down and went back up. And we're sitting right here, January 2013, saying let's, let's do something about this building because it's our worst. So get perspective, frame perspective on what this building is. So we all want to talk uh, plants and systems. It's, uh, you know, nothing super fancy. We're talking about a couple air-cooled chillers, um, gas-fired boilers at the time. When we started this project, um, the, it was variable secondary with constant volume primary, and there wasn't condensing boilers, it was atmospheric boilers. But the vast majority of the savings you'll see was not from a source efficiency improvement on the, on the boilers, it was more utilization driven. On the air handling side, we've got uh, VAB air handlers, single duct reheat uh, terminal units, uh, dedicated outside air units, and uh, some single zone VAB air handling units. So you give an eye, this is the, you know, kind of finger school layout. Most of it's single story. You've got a middle piece there that's two story. And the purple is where all the VAVs are at. 
Um, there's our chillers over there, but not very much. So what we knew going into this was that um, as of January 2013, the school district had already spent about, uh, I can add the numbers up, but maybe one and a half to two million dollars replacing equipment. But the efficiency of the school didn't get any better because the idea was, well, the reason it's inefficient is because it's got old equipment. And those two things don't necessarily go together because I've said before, you know, an old air handler versus a new air handler, the new air handler is not any more efficient than the old air handler if it's being told to run the same way as the old air handler, right? Um, so we knew we had 20 year plus uh, equipment and so we were starting to replace that. So here goes that, you know, we've got to rebuild a building in, in six weeks. So we have to start doing this in stages over, over summers. So here's summer 2007, we, uh, we had to replace the terminal units. We knew a good deal of the issues going way back, everyone knew this forever, that were the terminal units. Um, these had those wonderful terminal units, the, uh, the, the, old, uh, the old screw valve terminal units, you know? And uh, so the good deal of those that we looked at had two by fours propping them open. And so the, uh, the wooden modulating actuator wasn't very effective. <coughs> So we started out with, this is what they did. This was not, so another note, not commissioned. So we replaced all the terminal, they replaced all the terminal units. This was before they were doing commissioning as standard practice. We kind of had to get into them. That new school I mentioned, that was their first exposure to commissioning. And the only reason they did the commissioning is Lead said you have to do commissioning. And after they saw it, it was eye opening. And then they started, we're gonna do this everywhere. But they also started leaning into it slowly. Uh, they made their own definition of what they called limited commissioning. So we started out doing projects called limited commissioning as defined by the district. That was all we did was come in and do functional testing and then we were gone. So very, very small involvement. You know, by the time we got there, if it was really messed up, it was, you know, kind of hard to fix it that, that well. So we proceeded from 2010 to 2012 and this gets us up to kind of present day uh, replacing equipment. So we replaced all the outside air units did limited commissioning, just, you know, we're inside, we got our blinders on and we're just looking at the outside air units. Are they doing what they're supposed to do? Okay, we did, we're gone. Same thing with uh, air handling units and then in, in summer 2012, uh, replaced the chillers. So we spent all this money to get to this point, but our energy benefits were very limited um, because it kind of goes hand in hand with commissioning scope. So let me explain this chart. This is that same uh, history we were looking at over those eight years, but now I overlay these projects on it. And you can see you know, down here at the end, this is our decision made to retro commission. Uh, here's our average. Here's project one, we replaced the terminal units. And once we got, this is a 12 month rolling EUI, which I really like as a measure of, of how a building's performing over time. So take the last 12 months and keep adding them together. And so if you implement something, it takes about 12 months for it to fully affect you know, your annual EUI. Uh, and so what we saw here, here's the terminal units replaced. Here's a three year period before we did anything else. And we had a 19% EUI reduction, and that's basically you know, because we had terminal units that would actually modulate. Now, they still had a lot of problems, but at least they were working somewhat. And then we replaced our outside air units right here, project two, and we went this year period and really EUI didn't do anything. And we started replacing our air handling units, and all of a sudden, you know, our, our EUI went up again. So again, you forced the owner saying, man, we've just spent $2 million or $1.5 million and we're using more energy. What the heck's going on? So we got in there and said, let's, let's look at this a little bit and let's look at this from a, you know, do an existing building commissioning, retro commissioning, energy management, whatever you want to call it. It's all, um, all for the same purpose and it all goes together in my mind. So we, we started out by let's, let's dive into the utilities. Uh, anybody that knows me, I, you know, I love the statistics. I'll have to apologize in advance because also if you know me, I'm, I'm making my presentations all the way up to the last second. So you may have a few missing pages. But the, the full final presentation will be on the ACG website, but hopefully you can at least get along. I think there's, this is bonus material in here. Um, so we go, and we, the first thing we want to do is look at our uh, annual profile, and we'll revisit all this again after we, you know, we've done the project. Um, so, well, hello. Okay. Oh, that's my question. So we've looking at natural gas, annual profile. What's our natural gas doing over a year period? What's our electric doing? And we can see this is the three years prior to this decision point, 2010 through 2012 um, with the bars. You can see it's fairly consistent all along. 
and this profile, especially for our uh, natural gas profile. Uh, one thing you'll notice, a lot of this is in what we call school year instead of calendar year, because especially the way we do our projects, you know, accounting for the effects of projects that are done every summer, uh, the school year or the school district wants to account for savings and costs with their fiscal year. So we do most of our analysis and that's when you see the SY school and that's meaning school year rather than calendar year. So, and then these uh, shaded out regions, those are the summer months, July and June and July. So we kind of shade those to say, hey, don't really pay attention to what's happening here because a lot of times there's projects going on or there's nobody there. Um, but we're not seeing, we didn't, so we did this annual profile. We're not seeing what we would expect relative to these systems in, in our location. So it gives us a, a perspective. You can also see that uh, the red is our latest year. And not only is it bad, but it's getting worse um, going forward. So here's your statistical class for the, the morning. Um, so doing correlation, utility bills versus cooling degree day, heating degree day. One of the things that we do is we can kind of, you can benchmark uh, correlation against other buildings and you're looking for a pattern relative to balance points and correlation. So uh, what we all know is, so we're doing a correlation so we can see cooling degree days versus electric and heating degree day versus gas consumption. And we should see some type of correlation and also looking at where that balance point is. Balance point being the temperature at which your building starts to require heating, okay? So one thing you first notice in this, in school year 2011, our gas consumption had a very high correlation above 80% with the cooling degree days. So in layman's terms, the hotter it got, the more gas we used, right? That's definitely not a good thing, right? You know, and you go back and recheck the spreadsheets over and over, yeah, that's really what was happening. And electric consumption had nearly a 0% correlation with our cooling degree days. So here's your different balance points from 55 to 75, and this is correlation coefficient. So we had above a 0.8 across this entire range, and it, it peaked out the hotter we got. So that, that starts to point us in the, in the direction we're gonna go. And then you're looking at the optimum balance point for your natural gas consumption, the highest R squared. Here's correlation coefficient, and this is just heating degree days. Now we're going, you know, our balance point at which we had the best correlation. I only, I only do from 55 to 75, but it was actually gonna be off the chart. So we're saying that as soon as the temperature gets below 75, we, that's our balance point for heating this building. So this is a, you know, kind of a health check. Why does it keep doing that? Kind of a health check on your building to see how things are related. Let's see if I plug it in a little better. The next thing we look at is um, out of that, we're saying now we picked a balance point that we're gonna look at, and usually we'll pick a standard between 55, 65. In this case, the, our end result that I'm gonna compare or show you is with a 55 degree balance point, so that's where I'm at. So now we're looking at the scatter plot, kilowatt per hours per day versus degree days per day, that's cooling degree days, and cubic feet per day versus uh, cooling degree days. Or, I'm sorry, heating degree days, here's our natural gas. So what that shows us that our, this is showing us our response to weather. So the more slope that line is, meaning, okay, the hotter it gets, the more energy I'm using. How is it related to energy? Uh, another more important thing is that this intercepts. This intercept means wherever that intercepts at, that means I'm gonna use that much electricity or that much natural gas, regardless of the outside air temperature, okay? So you're looking at that before and after projects and also looking at that compared to other similar projects really opens your eyes as to what might be going on in the building. So, We'll keep these for uh, you know, future reference. Daily consumption, 11,400 kilowatt hours per day, no matter what the temperature is, that's our intercept. Basically zero correlation. And then down here on the heating degree side, if, the, you know, if we had zero heating degree days, you know, we're still consuming 7441 cubic feet per day of gas and 0.3 correlation, fairly low correlation as well. So this is where we said, okay, obviously we need to do something. Here's the coming up. We already had another phase of capital replacement that was coming already on the books, and that is our uh, phase five equipment replacement was replacing the rest of the air handlers and putting in new hot water boilers. So we had this, uh, and it was bidding at the time we started talking about doing this uh, more holistic, whole building retro commissioning. So it was decided that along with that, let's, we're gonna do a, a retro commissioning effort, energy management project on this building and so alongside of that, so we did this project, and then in parallel path, we were doing retro commissioning at the same time as the contractor was replacing and installing these new systems. And then from 2014, we finished that, end of 2013, and from 2014 to present, we had already decided then we'll, then we'll implement an ongoing monitoring-based commissioning program. So let's talk about investigation, and, and I could, um, could have filled the entire slide deck with these, uh, these types of things, but, um, 
one of the things you know, we found was that uh, you know, everything goes down to the zone level. When we talk about doing optimized control sequences, I say end-to-end -end optimization. I'm always trying to get all the way down to the zone. I want the zones to determine what the air handlers are doing, what the air handlers are determine what the chiller plant's doing, so that we're connecting demand to, you know, our equipment. And so if you have a problem down here at this level, then it doesn't matter what you do at the air handlers and the chiller plant, and that's what we were, this is really the crux of the problem at this building, is that we were, we were controlling the air handlers correctly, but it was everything down at the front, at the very bottom level of the system. And so sometimes we also see that um, we go into buildings and you see they have trends set up on, or they're doing some type of monitoring on everything but the VAV boxes. The, and the, the idea is, well, those, that's just little pieces of equipment. We just, we just worry that the main things are working right. Well, like I said, if the, if the little things aren't working right, then the main things aren't gonna work right either. So this is what we found, you know, 46%, and keep in mind, these VAVs had just been replaced six years ago, but that project was never commissioned, and I have some sneaking suspicions about the, the quality of the tab work that may have been done. So we had nearly 50% of the VAVs that weren't calibrated. Um, so we recalibrated 70% of them as we were doing, and so this is nothing, we do, as we're doing our investigation, we're rebalancing, we're recalibrating these boxes, we're not putting up together a list and saying, now you need to go do this. We're investigating and we're correcting at the same time. Also, the thermostats. So these were 20-year-old thermostats that had a lot of drift sensor air associated with them. So 42% of our thermostats were more than one degree off. Um, so some of those, if they were within uh, one, one and a half degrees, we calibrated them. The other ones, we put together a list of replacements to come and replace. Um, a lot of the VAV controllers were simply failed and needed to be replaced. Um, but the biggest find was that there was a very large quantity of VAV hot water reheat valves that were either failed open or leaking by. And so there's your connection with, you know, the hotter it got outside, the more heating I did, because the hotter it got outside, the more cooling I, you know, more cooling air I blew over those coils and the more heat I pulled out of my hot water system. And so my heating load would go up as my cooling load went up. And then we also had a, a manually balanced variable volume hot water system, which when, where's the, when's the only time that system is balanced? Right, when everything's wide open. So we had, a, you know, we had a manually balanced system that probably wouldn't have worked right in the first place if it was balanced. And that had been undone by maintenance over the years. So we had the, you know, oh, they got a hot complaint, I go and I'll tweak the valve. They got a cold complaint, I go and I tweak the balancing valve. So that was a, a big source of problem. Um, air handling units and outside air units. So air handling units, we had, uh, you know, very ineffective or overridden uh, optimization routines, supplier reset, static pressure reset logic. Uh, there was basically no optimization being done, per se. And a small thing, one VFD was in hand at 100% because the drive circuit had been broken for a couple of years. Um, but here's a huge piece, outside air units. So when we, and we actually commissioned the outside air units, we did our limited testing, limited testing on the outside air units, and we put them in. And uh, they were, they're factory controllers, and they were all working like the factory said they were supposed to. And at the time we left them, they were also talking to the BAS, and the BAS was telling them when to come on and off. Uh, it was doing what it was supposed to be doing. So what we found when we come back, and I know the resolution's just not very good on here, but um, if you can see, so these are integrated by lawn to the BAS. And so when our lawn comm trunk went down, they defaulted to you know, the, the lawn default of 32 degrees. So our dew point set point and our cooling coil, our set points all went to 32 degrees in response to our cooling valves all go 100% open. So we had wide open cooling valves 100% of the time on the outside air units, not because they weren't working right, it's just because comm failed and that's what they were being told to do. Uh, then we had an outside air unit for one wing that hadn't operated for over a year. Um, then there was no optimization being done between the outside air units. The outside air units had the capability of giving them a dew point set point, a final even air temperature set point, but those stayed locked down at one number all the time. So there's opportunity, you know, opportunity there that wasn't being taken advantage of. Heating plant, um, hot water pumps were running at 100% because we had a failed VP sensor. And we also had all those heating valves failed open, so that just helped us a lot too. Um, boiler enabled disable was not functioning, so the boiler plant was running in it continuously. Cooling plant, you're starting to see the picture, right? And now you can understand why it's a, now you see why it's a two energy star. Um, on the cooling plant, so we, we had an extremely low, now it's a variable volume system uh, on the building side. We had a very, very low chill water temperature differential, less than five degrees, so we were excess flow in the building, which caused us to reverse flow in the bypass. So basically we had to run two chillers all the time, no matter what, 
based on the logic in place because we didn't want to have reverse flow and get sent warmer water to the building. So we've got two chillers going all the time, two primary pumps going all the time. We're just running. Oh, and then a, a, another failed DP sensor. Uh, so the plant was controlling by the plant DP and not a remote DP, which is fine if you do a plant DP, but you've got to have a reset logic in place that's going to reset that plant DP. Otherwise, you're going to run your pumps at a high speed all the time with no, uh, no turn down. So corrective measures. So now we've got, we, we came out of this with corrective measures, and then also we've got some energy conservation opportunities. So the corrective measures, we just go through and, you know, basically fixing all these things we found, replaced all the terminating hot water control valves, and we put um, automatic flow control valves on the terminal units uh, so they couldn't be unbalanced later on and we could actually uh, have our flows whenever the system was at something other than 100%. We replaced our existing air, air handler DDC controllers with new back net controllers. Um, we're, we're moving over to a new standard controller type for the district. It also gave us the opportunity to implement some of the newer, some of our newer um, optimization logic that the old controllers couldn't handle. So the phase that was going on right now, there were six more air handlers being put in. They were getting the new controllers, so we upgraded the old air handlers, old as in being just a few years old. Um, but then the, we got them all onto back net MSDP you know, newer controllers. Um, replace that one drive that wouldn't work. Um, so we had to troubleshoot and repair the lawn integration. Uh, ended up being a couple different issues. You know, um, one was a wiring issue, one was, an, was a uh, lawn repeater issue. We got all that up and talking so we could actually do something with it, at least turn it off and on. And then uh, calibrate and repair all kinds of BAS sensors and devices. As we went through and did our, our existing building commissioning, retro commissioning investigation, we were checking all those sensors and devices, and so we had a good list of those. As we went through and did our investigation, we're creating our issue, an issue log as we went. So then an issue log was then turned around and items assigned to contractors, items assigned to maintenance. So this is also a great example, again, of a contractor working alongside of owners, maintenance personnel, working alongside of the controls contractor who was on the job underneath the, both the contractor doing the capital work and underneath the owner doing this, uh, you know, investigation repair work. And then obviously we had already calibrated most all of these VAB boxes as we were doing our investigation, but at one point we finally stopped and said, okay, we've tested 75% of them and they all need to be done, so we're just going to do that, you know, this coming summer. So then our conservation measures, uh, and you guys see at the bottom, this is the cost of the only these corrective measures is $67,000. So once we start talking about the amount of money that the building being, was wasting, you'll find, you know, in the end, the owner's, was, their response was like, man, it was only cost us $67,000, and that actually got us the majority of the savings that we're going to talk about. Um, so then we add in these other things, like, well, while we're fixing it, let's just not put it back to semi-okay, let's improve things. So we added an additional building level controller, another ENC, to let us do some expanded optimization logic. And also it gave us enough headroom to, do, um, to facilitate our ongoing monitoring. So we needed some more um, power, if you will, for doing our uh, trending and our reporting that we were going to do. We modified the chiller plant to be variable flow primary and variable flow secondary. Um, so we're going to get control of our cooling valves, and then we actually dialed our primary pumps down what we were shooting for is, is trying to just basically balance out your bypass so we didn't have any flow in the bypass, matching our, matching our primary delta T to our secondary delta T, uh, adding space humidity sensors uh, to the air handling unit so we could actually do proper reset, which in our area, proper reset means, you know, don't forget about humidity, uh, you know, don't let the humidity get out of control if you're chasing something else. Uh, new sequences and reprogram all the air handlers and, and the outside air units, cooling heating plants with what we call our end-to-end -end optimization logic. Um, we gave a couple examples of that. And then functionally performance everything to our new sequences. Um, and then implementing our trend data analysis on main monitoring to make sure we get it right in the beginning and that we keep it right. And you'll see we actually will drive it down further. So the total cost of, of all of that was 218 ish thousand dollars. Again, once you see, you know, the benefits from it, it's fairly, you know, minuscule compared to all the money that's being wasted over the years. So one of the things that we end up doing on a lot of our projects like this um, is this sequence document was created by us uh, for every system in the building. So we put a diagram, points list, and then um, operating logic. So we had been working actually with this district in all our newer buildings and new projects to kind of standardize sequences and standardize block pieces of sequences. So we were able to take and implement 
all that standardized sequence logic into these. Of course, every building's a little different, so we made the modifications. So we're providing these to the controls contractor. There's our chiller plant, there's one of the air handlers, so they can implement that, and then we can test it. So ongoing commissioning methodology. So the, um, in broad terms, you know, we're taking the building automation system and we're sending that information out to a, a cloud-based um, trend data monitoring fault detection service, and then we can interface with that with you know, a tablet or a computer or whatnot. Um, this is it from a, from a, a diagrammatic point of view, and I was trying to put this together, and, and I moved my blocks all around, and I still couldn't get anything I was real happy with, but we'll take it from the top and see, see what you think. So the way that this works for us is that we have a, uh, an ongoing fee structure with our client. We have a monitoring uh, service fee that we usually bill on a quarterly basis. And we also have an investigation allowance. That investigation allowance is so that as we find things and they want, and it's not maybe clear cut exactly what the problem might be, they can use that allowance to send us out to the job site. Well, why don't y'all look into that further for us? That gives them a, an in-place mechanism to utilize us. Um, and it gives us more money, so we like it too. Um, so what we're going here is we have the BAS data reporting. It's feeding into the uh, fault detection, the monitoring service platform. And then if these, these expert rules trigger uh, there's a potential issue, diagnostic hit, then it hits out to this diagnostic interface. That interface is, is a service that we're providing behind the scenes. The owner doesn't have to look at that uh, because one of, you know, it's the software's not the product that we're being, that's being provided. The product is still you, it's still our service. It's just that that software, that platform, lets us do more with less and, and uh, provide a service that we couldn't otherwise. So our CX technician, engineer, authority, whatever you want to call us, analyst is what we call it in this context, we'll decide, uh, is it a real issue or not? If it's not, then we dismiss it, or we modify the diagnostic conditions, and that goes into a history um, so that you know every time one of those hit, you can go back and say, well, somebody's dismissed this 20 times in the last 10 days. Maybe it really is a problem. We don't want to just uh, get rid of it. Um, or if it, yes, we say it is an issue, then we elevate it to an issue, um, to an ongoing issue log. And that on that issue log, and this is, again, this is where your owner, and I wish Roger was here, the mechanical engineer, um, they have to be involved in this process. I mean, that's, this is a, you know, an integrated team. Um, you know, I call him, he, I call him the quarterback of the team. So I assign originally an issue to my owner's point of contact. He decides if there's something that his maintenance department's going to handle. He also has a separate controls division, so he can assign it to the maintenance department, the controls division. He can then kick it to me and say, you guys go look at this further for me. He kind of decides where that's going to go and all that's done on that, on that issue log. So the owner point of contact assigns it to the responsible party. And my other nickname for Roger, if he's here, is uh, sometimes when I can't get something done with a supplier or a contractor, he says, I'll call, and then as soon as he calls, all of a sudden I get what I wanted, and so he says, I just have a big hammer. And so he always says, I just have a bigger hammer, and so I started calling him Thor, is my new nickname for, for Roger. So if, if Thor needs to get involved, he can do that. And then, uh, so that goes to a maintenance or a contractor action, or perhaps a CX action. Uh, if it's resolved, you know, it's recorded, what's been done, goes to the issue log as, as a kind of pending or monitoring category. And then we may, if we need to go to the field and verify something, or a lot of times we can verify it by, you know, by the diagnostic interface. And so if it's resolved, we say yes, you know, record exactly what was done. It's closed out for future reference, but it's all still there. Um, and a lot of times, no, you know, we good try, but you didn't, you didn't quite get there. And so we'll kick it back around the feedback uh, to the back to that same person, assign it back to them and say, you know, try again. So that's the basic, basic uh, procedure. So, and I wish, again, I thought these would come out a little clearer with the projector or whatnot, but here's some examples of things you might see and things that may fail. Because one, one of the, the good things and one of the uh, you know, evils of building automation systems is that they're kind of self-healing, right? So just because the room is 72 degrees doesn't mean everything in the background is working right. But the problem is that most of the time, the only time maintenance gets involved is if a room's not at temperature. But just because you've got an entire building of rooms that aren't at temperature, it's not a necessarily a good thing. So something like this, for instance, this is a chill water valve failed open, leaking by. If you can't read the numbers, you know, this is up here, supplier temperature set point of 72 degrees. So this was during a cooler period of the year. Our supplier reset's working right. It's, it's set up. Um, but here's our cooling valve position at zero down here. But I've got a supplier temperature of 65 degrees, okay? So was this causing any comfort problems in the spaces? It wasn't because what my reheat valves, they, they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're saying, 
the room's cold, I'm going to open up, I'm going to heat it, you know, teachers are happy, no problems, but we've got a major energy uh, issue there, both on the cooling and on the heating side. So you, you can find that without having to look for it. So the rules would kick that up and say, hey, you got a problem, and analyst looks at it and goes, yeah, that's definitely a problem, gets kicked to the maintenance guy for them to take care of. Um, something like this, again, this is one of those, you know, uh, phantom issues that would go uh, unseen. So we got an out of control VAV box. The airflow set point is down here at the bottom. Uh, it's a pretty much a flat line right there because the room's too cold, so it's at minimum. And the airflow is doing this up and down, you know, all the way up to 1800 CFM. So we've got a, an issue with the airflow measurement uh, on the VAV box. The heating valve, again, was doing its job, and it's not too cold. Now, it's a little cold, 68 degrees, but in the winter, you're probably not going to get a complaint for a 68 degree room in the winter. So again, this is something that would get flagged, would get caught, get dealt with. Um, reheat valve leaking by. So this is like days when we got into this, you know, we've already fixed, all, at this point, we'd already fixed and replaced all these valves. These are all brand new. So they should just, they should work right for a long time, right? No. Uh, so, you know, what happened with all those reheat valves didn't happen all at one time. It happened one by one by one by one. So over, you know, a 15 year period, all of a sudden 50% of our valves are leaking by or, or open. Oh, the, the, the back story on the VAV valves leaking by is that uh, after we took them out and started looking at them, most of them, the seats were eroded away to almost nothing. You start talking to the maintenance guys and they say, well, I wonder if that had something to do, you know, for a long time, our hot water VFD was broken and we just had to run it at 100%. So you had for a long time, all those valves trying to fight back against the pressure and we were, you know, high velocity. We wore out the seats on a lot of the valves is how some of it happened. All because, you know, they didn't want to spend a couple thousand dollars on a drive. Um, so here's one, you know, two months after this was replaced. We've got a, uh, and again, not causing a comfort problem in the room. Here, my temperature is right there. It's, you know, temperature's all good. Uh, but here's my supplier temperature from the air handler. And uh, you know, I can't even read it on that screen. I know I can read it on mine. Supplier temperature from the air handler was 58 degrees. And I'm coming off the VAB box at 78 degrees with a 0% hot water valve. So again, would this be caught? Maybe if somebody's paging through graphics and they say they just happen to notice it, but most people aren't gonna be doing that. So this is something that you catch. And so now we're gonna catch these as they happen instead of letting them accumulate into an entire building issue. Um, a little bit more advanced uh, thing you might see is loop control. So um, all of your control contractors probably spend weeks and weeks after the job's done tuning the control loops, right? We, they don't in our area. So. Uh, and it's also something that we may not see when we do what I call, you know, snapshot testing. Uh, you may not sit there long enough to see, is that really hunting or not? And we all intend to go back and get trend data and make sure the control loops are right, but, you know, it's, it's hard to follow through because of the time and expense involved in doing that. So one of the things that we can check for is loop tuning. So this is, you know, on the left side, this is a bad chill water. You know, we're trying to control to that temperature right there, flat line, this is the temperature. The dotted bluish line is the control valve doing that. And then so we bring it up as an issue. And the, the dotted black line is a moving average. So the system will, we can tell it how many periods we want to use and it'll calculate a moving average. And that's one of the ways we can tell if a loop is hunting is by looking at the moving average of the output versus the actual output and looking to see if it's varying time after, after period after period. So they went and they worked on it and there's the next day, um, he fixed it right about there. And the next day we're right on top of the set point. And you can see that moving average is right in the middle of the actual valve command. Optimization routines. So optimization routines are great, but depending on how they're set up, you can have one rogue VAV that will, you know, take away all the benefit of an optimization routine. Perfect example here is, is an optimization routine we call outlier monitoring. So I'm looking at, I'm setting my static pressure based on my VAV damper positions, right? It's a pretty common thing to do, and I'm saying if I have a VAV damper 100% open, I need more static pressure, and I'm going to keep setting my static pressure up. Well, so this is a chart that shows every single VAV on that air handle, and here's the damper positions. I've got one VAV damper up there at the top that's 100% open, so you see my static pressure stays at the max set point all day long because of that outlier. So again, would you or would you not catch this by, you know, if you didn't have something, you know, doing this for you? Um, so it gets corrected. You know, that was an issue with the flow control in the box. It gets fixed. And then after it was corrected, you see the fan speed was 70% there. If I scrolled further down in that picture, you would have seen the two days later in the exact same conditions, the fan speed goes from 70% to 50% speed. 
well, because we all know that's the cubic relationship on that fan speed to power, so that was a fan power decrease of 64%. And all of that is just because of that one VAV airflow issue that may you, when are you gonna catch it? One of the things that is really invaluable is having uh, utility level metering connected to your BAS. A really, really big proponent of that stuff should be feeding to your BAS. Uh, one reason is you know, it's a good common reporting platform. The other reason is if that information is available to you on the BAS, you can use it to actually make decisions. You can use, do operational logic using that information. So uh, this, will let, this lets us see, I like this output chart because what it does is shows us interval um, BTUs, heating BTUs, cooling BTUs, and building power, and then weather conditions all in the same chart. So I can look through and see how much simultaneous heating and cooling am I doing at the build, on a building level, and it's just real easy to see because this is all an MBH. Instead of having tons and BTUs, this is all MBH so that it's a common scale. Um, optimization things, we talked about those outside air units. You know, they were great outside air units, but they weren't being told to run correctly. So back to getting that end-to-end -end optimization, we want to take the outside air units and say, hey, uh, you know, they started out saying, I'm gonna be set on a 52 degree dew point um, leaving condition all the time. Well, I know we're really, really humid and you know, it's a jungle out there, but there is actually some of the year we don't need to do that. So we connect the space humidity to the dew point set point and we can reset our dew point set point based on what the space humidity is doing. Again, what's happening in the space connected to that and of course, then that feeds back to the chiller plant relative to savings. And then the other piece of this is discharge air temperature. So these were set up originally by design that they were gonna do a constant, uh, you know, outside air units, you see it's a neutral, you know, we're delivering neutral air to the space. Well, sometimes if, the, if every VAV box in that space wants cooling, then why are we heating the air back up and then dumping it in neutral, let it go out cold? So we do is we connect, connect your zone cooling heating demand to logic that determines what that final set point needs to be. So if we can get cooling from the outside air, why not get it? And then on the flip side, if all of our VAVs are in heating, then we'll provide heating at that unit and then deliver it more neutral. So that's something that we do there. So this is the, I think this is the coolest chart in this presentation. So now we're looking at, um, this is where we made the decision to do this uh, comprehensive project. Same idea, here's my EUI mountain. Uh, here's the district average for every building in the district. Here's project four, replace air-cooled chillers. Uh, and here's our one-year period. So we saw a 25% EUI reduction after a year after replacing the chillers. And that is because, you know, it was old crappy chillers and now we've got good new manufactured be unnamed chillers that are more efficient. So yeah, we, and we did actually start to improve control at that point. So we'd get a good, nice 25% reduction. Then we go to project five, which was replacing the boilers, air handling units, implementing all those repairs, all those corrective measures, uh, energy conservation measures. You go one year out and now we've dropped it another 50%. So we have 25%, 50%. Now we get to this point, we've, we've been a year out, so we've captured all the savings from the project, if you will. Now as we go, this is kind of like, you know, having your cake and eating it too. This is savings that we get as we see these optimization opportunities and we keep pushing it down. So this is all the way out to um, March of this year. And so, in the next nine months here, we had another 23% decrease in the EUI, simply from seeing the opportunities to continually push down uh, the, the efficiency or increase the efficiency in the way things are operating. So I think this is, tells the entire story. But I love charts, so let the, I love the numbers teach you. So here we go, this is another way of looking at it. Uh, if we do, each one of these lines is a year EUI, and it's a cumulative as you start from, again, school year based. So July through June. Uh, we start here, you know, at zero, ground, ground zero, and we build out. These are the three previous years. This was the year after the majority of the project, and, and then this is this year right now. So this gap that we have that we're pulling down, we're getting about that 15 to 25 percent month by month by month um, savings over the previous year from, you know, keeping our eyes on, you know, keeping your fingers on the pulse. And then energy specific, you know, we can look at that too. And you say, you know, here back here was uh, before we did anything, you're looking at electric and gas EUIs, fuel specific EUIs. And you can see what we did, you know, dropping them down, you know, especially there was, you know, more savings on the gas side than the electric side. And then your total EUI and watching how it's dropping. And these are school year um, EUIs at the end of those particular school years. So here's the money. So, you know, show me the money. Uh, projected gross, you know, non-corrected. So 
we didn't do any uh, formal MMB on this project. The, you know, the, it was obviously, you know, no matter what we do, we weren't going to make it worse, right? Um, and the, uh, what we did do was in order to help my school district's facility guys uh, justify getting more money. So it's basically, you know, look, you gave me this much money, and then look what we did with it. Now give me more money, and I'll do some more with it. And so this became our model and, and you know, our mantra to be able to say to the school board, we'll make money for you, just give us some to start with. Um, so you know, here you see starting out at 669,000, and in the current school year, uh, fiscal school year period, we've got two more months in it, but we're only up to 230,000 right now. So we're looking at, uh, and one of the more interesting things is saying, okay, right now gas-wise, we've only spent $20,000 in this entire school year, fiscal year. We spent that much in one month in, in 2011, 2012. January and December of those years, we spent $25,000 in one month. Um, so then in this last year, our additional savings that we're attributing to the monitoring base commissioning activities are around $75,000 of additional savings that we've you know, kind of tacked onto the project. Now you can see, if you see uh, in this EUI, you can see we're starting to level out. I mean, at some point, obviously, we can't make it go down forever, but the idea is that we're going to reach some theoretical minimum based on the properties of the systems and the building, and then, we'll, then we want to try and hold it there at a flat line going forward. So I think we're just about probably there, which we're around an EUI of around 46 uh, right now. Again, starting out from that 160, and if we went back a few more years, you know, we actually peaked out over 180 for a couple months. Um, so, cost history. So these solid lines, these are the lines we used when we were justifying the project to begin with, we call our steady rates, but if you wanted to see what was happening, we actually saved all this money as our electric rate went up by about 25% over that same period of time. So our electric rate's going up at the same time. Again, we didn't go back and say, well, you know, based on, you know, we would actually save more because the electric rate went up and it watered down what it looked like our savings to be. Uh, we, we didn't do that. And then gas costs stayed fairly level uh, up and then come back down. So one of the things we always like to do is we have all that analysis that we do in the front end. We try and, you know, that's the before picture. Now here's the after picture. So we'll look at those same charts and we add all that back. Um, here's the, the annual profiles the bottom two little bars you can see that's you know the last two years gas consumption <laughs> there's where we were and there's where we are now you know obviously a, a cool picture to look at same thing on the electrical you see um, the next the last two years right here and then another way we look at it is, is a trend chart so we look at an even number of months this is a 36 month trend chart that shows the utility and also the, whatever the, um, the independent weather variable that we associate with that utility, so cooling degree days, heating degree days. Uh, this is natural gas, and this is a trend line. So the trend line on the natural gas is doing that, and then the weather component is actually trending. So our weather's trending up, and you know, it's getting colder, and we're actually using less. It's a good thing. Same thing on, on electric. So here's our electric trending down, monthly consumption, and there's your cooling degree days um, trending a little down as well. And then did the weather help us out, help or hurt the savings? Actually, we've had uh, a couple pretty darn cold winters relative to our standards. Um, so heating degree days, we actually had more heating degree days. This is those years, 2011 through 15. And you can see in 2014, um, anybody remember, you remember the, what'd they call it, the Polar Express? No, not the Polar, that's a movie. Uh, polar Vortex, I'm sorry. <laughs> not the Polar Express, it felt like it. So, yeah, we had the polar vortex come down, right? In Pensacola, Florida, we got coated with three inches of ice, and everybody didn't know what to do for days until we finally said, we've got all this beach sand, let's just start dumping it on the roads. And um, so we started dumping our sugar white sand on all of our roads for a while. But anyway, so that's, that's that point right there. You know, we pegged uh, 425 heating degree days in the month of January uh, in that, during that uh, polar vortex. So we actually did get colder. And cooling degree day weather-wise, we stayed fairly similar. Um, there wasn't a significant difference in cooling degree days. So let's look back at these charts. This is, again, I love these before and after pictures. So balance point correlation charts. This is school year 11. This is school year 14. We just, we just flipped it. You see up here, our heating degree days had all that high correlation to cooling. Our heating had correlation to cooling degree days. Now if we look down here, it no longer does. 
and then the cooling degree days is actually up here at the top. Now we have actually have electrical correlation to our cooling degree days. So now this is what you would expect to see relative to uh, how these are related. And then the same thing, similar charts where we said this is our before, where the hotter it got, the more our heating, the more we were correlated to our gas consumption. And now it's not, you know, it's not the same. So we, now we have the balance points. Our optimum balance point for cooling is around or below 55 as it should, or for heating is around or below 55 like it should be. And then these charts are also very interesting. So now we've got the four years. We've got the red is uh, before we did anything. The blue is kind of in the middle, and then our green was after we did everything except for ongoing commissioning, um, and so, uh, the purple ones after ongoing commissioning. So we had these before. This is our cooling degree day um, uh, electrical consumption chart. And you see our baseline was intersecting up here. Now look where it's intersecting all the way down here. So it went from a daily consumption non-weather related of 11,000 down to 4,000. And our correlation went from basically nil to 0.65. Um, you can also see, so now in the next year, uh, the purple line, you see we're hitting the axis at about the exact same point. So now we're not changing the baseline consumption, but what we're changing is how the building reacts to hotter weather. So now the slope of our line is coming down because we're, our building's reacting more efficiently to hot weather. So that's what we get out of that. And then on the, on the gas side, here's where we are hitting the axis before, and now we're way down here at the bottom. So our daily non-weather related consumption went from 7,000 plus to 2,000, and our correlation went to you know, above 0.8. There's the polar vortex right there, which is kind of neat. This is, the core, you know, this is the linear trend, and that sucker followed on the line all the way out to predict it exactly what that you know, heating consumption was during the polar vortex, which is like a huge outlier. So these are our two before we did our project years, and you can see there's no data past that to the right. So this is after the fact. So we've had a lot cooler, or yeah, a lot colder weather since. So back to the beginning uh, of, you know, now what we do is, okay, good job, pat ourselves on the back, now which one's next? So we go use the same metrics again and look at the EUIs. Um, this one here was one of our, you know, dirty three at the bottom, Northview High School. That one's the next big one in line. That's what we're doing this summer. Same process, capital equipment replacement, retro commissioning, uh, and then implement our monitoring. Um, Warrington Elementary, this is a school that we're in the middle of doing this process. We're in the middle of the, we've finished all the investigation and we're now we're doing some of the corrections, but we're waiting for, the, waiting for school to get out so we can really uh, break things down. But just in the process of fixing what we have so far, two years till now, two years ago till now, we've the 35% EUI reduction just in those two years by what we've done thus far. Um, here's uh, Bailey Middle School, here's our case study project, so you see our, our 51 there, 68% EUI reduction overall in the two-year period. And then uh, GLA, which is our Global Learning Academy, that's that newer school that was good, and it kind of went up, and then we said, man, what happened? Well, let's put it on our program, we'll push it back down. So it's in the two years since we've been monitoring that one, we've down to 19, we've reduced the EUI 19% um, on that one. So lessons learned, again, a lot of this is from uh, Thor, uh, gave me a lot of these things, and he was going to talk about this, but, uh, you know, this is, and a lot of this I told him, I was like, man, this is going to be like, you're going to have people hooting and hollering, and you're going to preach into the choir, right? So always commission every project, no matter how simple it may seem. Uh, limiting the scope of commissioning will limit the benefits of commissioning. Uh, treat equipment replacement projects as energy projects. Uh, just replacing the equipment doesn't necessarily reduce the energy consumption. Uh, optimization routines must be thought through well and monitored so they don't become stuck you know, at one end of, of the logic loop. Um, even buildings perceived as having poor envelopes can be decent performing buildings. Don't make excuses for your building. This is a, I didn't mention this in the beginning. So Bailey Middle School is an architectural nightmare. Um, it's, a, it's, got ven it's a ventilated attic building. So I've got a metal standing seam roof, sloped standing seam roof. I've got ventilated eaves. I've got a lay-in seam with bat insulation laid on top of it. So I have a, I'm open to the world above and I've got no vapor barrier between my ceiling and my space. So for years and years and years, everybody just said, well, we all, we all know what the problem is with Bailey. It, the architect screwed it up. He didn't design the envelope right. So we'll just, it is what it is. Well, it wasn't what it was, right? We, it actually is, can be better. Now, fixing that envelope is something, we've actually fixed one wing of it and they're gonna keep going through and fixing that envelope. It's just, it's really expensive to fix, you know, that type of a problem on, a, on an existing building. We decided to spend the money on the HVAC 
and then spend the money on that envelope issue. Um, if performance isn't monitored as part of your testing, then we're leaving money on the table. Uh, that's the thing, you know, we can do our functional testing and try as best as we can to be as detailed as we can, but there's still usually juice to be squeezed out of the orange if we'll keep watching it and keep pushing it down. Uh, performance will degrade over time. We also all know this. You know, we have to find a solution that allows you for continuous and consistent monitoring. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can go about this. It doesn't have to be some type of automated detection system. You can, you can come up with some type of a, a regular reoccurring service where you can get access to the site and look at things. So, um, just because you can't go to the, you know, the ultimate, what I think is the ultimate solution, there's a lot of other things you can do. And then, but key to this is um, ensure that your solution, your plan, has a defined path for resolving found issues. So one of the, the challenges that we struggled with when our, we first started doing this for this owner is that now finding the problems was not the problem. Now we had so many problems that we found that we didn't have a good way for them to fix. You know, it took a while to get the maintenance department in tune with, hey, you guys actually found real problems and we can go fix them. But what we found is the maintenance, as a, as the maintenance guys go through that list and they go out and say, huh, that really is broken and I can fix it. The things that the maintenance uh, bosses say is that, you know, if I have a, a, a hot, I have a hot space complaint and I find out about it, I have to dispatch my maintenance guy. He's going to go out there and it'll be about three hours before he does his diagnostics. He figures out, this is what I need to do. He goes back and gets his parts and he goes back and he fixes it. He's got a half a day in it. He said, with what you're doing for us, you've told me the valve is broken. My guy takes the valve with him when he goes, the actuator, and 30 minutes later, he's fixed the problem. So he says, like, effectively, he can handle two to three times as many maintenance issues now with the same number of people because they're not doing, you know, they're not doing diagnosis. They're fixing things, and that's what maintenance people do well is they fix things, not as well to figure out what to fix. So um, that's been a, a success. So that is the end. Um, any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. And then also, um, I didn't show it, but we end up, we compare them to other buildings. So inside the same portfolio to see, okay, not just I look at EUI, but I look at how is this building responding to the weather like this other building responds to the weather. And then in this case, we knew that, you know, that shows you'll, you know, simultaneous heating and cooling a little bit too. You know, it can point to some specific control issues on how that responds. Yes, sir. With regard to the automatic fault detection, can you comment on the cost, the implementation difficulty, and how many tenants are in the field? That's a whole lot of questions. Uh, let's see. The uh, implementation difficulty, um, obviously a lot of that depends on, and that's why we did some of the BAS upgrades that we did so that it was capable of doing what we needed it to do. So that, that it's kind of, you're going to get real vendor specific. Um, this system happened to be a Schneider system, um, a Schneider to a Niagara front end. So that was the, the actual solution on this one is a Niagara front end. Um, but we've successfully done the same thing with, with Siemens, um, train, train Siemens, you know, the ones that are in our area. You know, our, our boots on the ground business is only a couple hour radius of Pensacola. So we've done, you know, what's, who's there? Siemens, Johnson, Train, Schneider, Automated Logic. Those are the ones that we're, that I'm most familiar with. Um, the cost of it, so the cost of just the pure monitoring on that, on that building, I know this doesn't include what you would need to include for your personnel time to deal, you know, to actually do this. Um, but just the monitoring cost on that would, is about uh, $600 a month is the pure, the pure software cost of it. The, uh, the other question was, was setup cost or setup time. So usually when we start one of these out from scratch, we have three pieces in the proposal. There's an installation cost, then there's the monitoring cost, then there's that investigation allowance piece. And that, that setup cost is real vendor specific. It also depends on who's setting up the BAS trends and the reporting. So, on some of them, we know enough about the control system and we have access that we do it ourselves. And then some the control or the owner's person, they can set the trends and reports up or they may have to pay the controls contractor to set it up. If it's a, new, if it's a, if it's a construction contract project, 
then we have our specifications structured so that it makes the contractor do it. Um, because we, we do this, the monitoring aspect of this, it's a little different for existing versus new, but we're using that for new construction too. So our, our warranty period is we're doing that, we're doing this ongoing monitoring for that first year of warranty. Then we get done, then, so we have, because we have the installation costs built into the contract project, we get to the end of the one year period, we've illustrated the value of it, then we can turn around and give a proposal to the owner to extend to renew it for another year and do another year, another year. So we call it performance, performance insurance. It's what, you know, we're selling performance insurance. They buy, they buy preventative maintenance contracts for chillers and boilers and everything else. Why not buy a preventative con maintenance contract for your, you know, energy performance? What about, what's the cost of performance? What's the, like the overall cost for, and again, you know, you have to define how much time you're gonna spend on dealing with the diagnostics and, and you can, but for that particular building, um, an annual contract on that size building is around, uh, I'm trying to remember that one. I, I think, I might be a little off, I think it's around a $25,000, $30,000 annual year. I think that might be a little high for that one. Well, usually you have to justify it based on your annual spend, or, or your utility spend in a year. So if you look at a building and, it's in the, and the utility costs are $500,000 in a year, and you say that um, I can prevent it from going up by 5% a year, so then it kind of justifies a $25,000 premium for your insurance, if you will. Um, so you've got to look at how much, you know, you can't do as much as you'd like to do on every project. It just depends on what you can help, you know, justify based on the utility spend. And there's also kind of a break point on size. If you get too small of a building, you know, that just you can't justify it that way. I have two most specific. Um, on the primary secondary uh, function unit, right. did you have to fill the pipe project for the decoupling? Well, there, there, was already a, there was already a bypass there, already a decoupler there. Okay. And so we had, you know, we had the choice of, of tearing out four, pump, four pumps that were just installed the year before and putting in two bigger ones, or going and saying, let's just control the primary as variable and then balance the bridge, the bridge that was already there. So it turned in, we installed two drives and a little bit of sensors. We actually did the flow, instead of having a flow meter, we were just using temperatures to tell when we were doing reverse flow or surplus flow. And we'd control to sur a slight surplus flow down to a minimum on the chillers. Of course, the chillers can only, that's, that's an important thing looking at that is, you know, how much will the chillers turn down flow-wise? Because if you look at it and the chillers, minimum flow is 70% of your primary pump, then it may not be worth do in this case that we could turn them down to like 40 percent on the primaries. So you have a portion of the industry right? you had projects like that too where they originally set up a good observation pump system and then they'll come in and screw it up. Right. Yeah. yeah, you've got to adapt it to what you got to work. Yeah, what you adapt to work you have to work with. Again, you know, the best of all worlds would have been to take to have two pumps, you know, primer, a, a standby pump and a hundred percent pump and pump through the chillers and through the building and have a minimum flow bypass, but that would have been Yes. Right. And that's a, they on this building they had a redundant building pump and then but we have a dedicated two dedicated primary pumps that were dedicated to the air cooled chillers. Yeah, we do we do chill water reset and Yeah, and that's why you have to watch it. And before you know it, you'll have things, you'll set up like a Tacoma Narrows bridge and the thing will start oscillating until everything is blowing up, right? So that's why you've got to watch it. But so um, down at, know, at the supplier temperature reset level, I mean, we use cooling demand to step up and step down the set point. Uh, and then that's kind of, there's that, there's a, two loops going on. There's a, one that's looking at the cooling demand of the VABs and there's one that's looking at the space humidity. And whichever one of those loops wants the colder temperature, that's the one that actually gets to sent to the supplier temperature set point. Um, and then you've got to tune those for the systems. Um, so then at static pressure reset, that one's fairly, like I said, fairly common. It's just going off of a damper position, trying to hold at least one damper. Right, yeah. I mean, and, and you got to, and so some of that ends up being uh, designed into the, it's a flaw that's designed into the system. So like you've got too much load in a room that holds the box wide open all the time. Well, in that case, 
you know, you have to go in there and maybe change the VAV box out to a bigger VAV box so that it's not holding the system out all the time. Well, a lot more at the beginning because, you know, it's, and it's on some existing buildings when we first turn it on, it's like, you know, it's too loud. You're like, Shh, turn the volume down because everything is screaming at you all at once. So we can freeze certain systems and just deal with it a piece at a time. And so depending on how bad the building is, I mean, it's hard to say, you know, but it, you kind of go through this prevent or uh, corrective phase. And then by the time you get all that dealt with, then it's kind of like, okay, now we're just kind of, you know, circling, waiting for something to pop up, boom, there it is, you know, send it as an issue, it gets dealt with. But at the beginning, depending on how bad the building is, then yeah, you're gonna, a lot more time at the, at the front end than, anybody else? Yes, sir. Small issues that they ask for recommendation to fix, like, Uh, okay. Yeah, well, some you're saying maybe they don't want to fix it because they're like, hey, it's not worth fixing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, we actually have some of those. Um, like one is, uh, okay, I've got a, a hallway VAV box that's not working right. And the, the guy, my owner, you know, Thor said, I don't care. It's just a hallway. Just ignore it. So we, we take and we put that. We, we have a category we call archive. So we archive that issue. And once the, once the diagnostics are sent to an issue, then it no longer, the only thing that keeps coming up in the diagnostics is new things. So once we archive it, it won't keep popping up as like, hey, you still got this problem, you still got this problem. But if we want to go and say, what's the archived items, it's still there. So it's not like we, you know, completely ignore it. We kind of just put it in the background. But we, but we, so we, yeah, we've had several things like that happen. It's like, hey, we know it's a problem, but there's, you know, there's more pressing issues and I'm not going to spend any money to fix that. So set it off to the side. Anybody else? A VFD running in hand? Yeah. Right, because the drive circuit, it was in bypass. Well, I mean, a lot of what we found was human errors. It's just you couldn't figure out which human did it, but in that, in that case, I mean, in that case, it was they actually, you know, uh, they kept asking, the maintenance man kept asking for the money to replace the drive, and he asked for several months and got, kept telling, we don't have money to do that right now, so he just stopped asking. So it was actually like a, I mean, it was his boss that said, you know, just, our, you know, and again, it was working, but people in the building weren't complaining. Well, yeah, and that's the retro commissioning, yes. I mean, that's like the original corrective thing, but more so the ongoing piece, you know, the monitoring piece is more of, of helping them with their own M. Okay. Because, again, you know, the result of that huge, terrible electric bill was years and years of attrition, both human and, you know, mechanical failures, like, just happens. So that's the point that, you know, is a better own M program.